If you haven't heard, the Montreal Canadiens have hired a brand new general manager, Kent Hughes, the 18th GM in team history. So, of course, we're going to spend most of our episode talking about Kent Hughes. Maybe you had no clue who he was before the start of this week. I hope by the end of this, you'll have some better understanding of who the man is, at least according to us four, on this week's edition of Hockey Inside Out. I'm Julian McKenzie, alongside Stu Cowan, Rick Green, Andrew Berkshire, once again, guest uh, of the show this week. Uh, dude, I appreciate you tapping in whenever we need you to. Uh, I, I, it's a damn shame because the very last time, as we're recording this, the very last time the Montreal Canadiens played, they won a game. It's not something that happens a lot. I was looking forward to hearing your thoughts about the Montreal Canadiens after a win. And that does not matter in the slightest because we have to talk about <laughs> Kent Hughes as general manager of the Montreal Canadiens. He had his intro press conference on uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Stu, you and I were there. Uh, we sat uh, too, mm -hmm. pretty close to each other, but not too close. Of course, Social distancing. Absolutely. You know the rules. Stu, I'd like to start with you. What were your takeaways uh, from the press conference? and uh, Kent Hughes being named general manager of the Montreal Canadiens. And one word, impressive. I thought everything about it was impressive. I thought the way they set it up on the ice at the Bell Centre with the scoreboard brought down behind them and the big CH logo. I thought the way they had the three of them uh, walk out from where the locker rooms are and walk along the carpets to the stage. They made it an event, and a made-for-TV event, and which heart, a new GM for the Montreal Canadiens should be that. And this has Chantal McAbee's fingerprints all over it with their TV background, how are we going to make this look really good? And it looked good. And Kent Hughes, again, really impressive. He really impressed me. I mean, I, I never met him. I spoke after he was named uh, GM to a lot of people who know him well. Uh, they all said the same thing. Very smart, very honest, very fair, great people skills. And all those things came across, I thought, in that news conference. And his French was really impressive. As Pat Hickey wrote in his column, one of the, his French was better than Mark Bergevin's French at news conferences. It was like, <laughs> Mark Bergevin's communication skills weren't his strongest point, especially standing in front of the media or answering questions from the media. He would ramble on at times, etc. But I just thought it was really impressive. And you can see why uh, Jeff Gorton wanted Kent Hughes as the GM. And as it, as it went on, and he kept answering questions, and they were grilled about, you know, why did you interview 11 people when it looked like uh, – you know, Kent Hughes was your guy right from the beginning. And Gorton had a great line saying, he's not my best friend, and you guys wouldn't want any of my best friends running the Montreal Canadiens, which I thought was hilarious. Um, so, yeah, just really impressive. And, and two, in Gorton and Hughes, two really smart men uh, who are, are friends. They're not best friends, but they are good friends. They respect each other. And I think they're going to work really well together. I think this was two really good hires by Jeff Molson, who – upset some members maybe some of the fan base and some francophone media members by hiring two anglophones even though uh you know hughes is bilingual uh but good on him because they got two i think really smart men now running the hockey operations yeah, and i was really happy to see a, a homegrown uh, montreal uh, guy step in there and you know um and he spoke uh, quite often about the pride and you know the history of being part of the montreal canadians organization and you know, he, he's a guy that grew up, knew what the, this city is all about, knows what the culture is all about. Uh, and obviously, with his experience, has a really good feel on, you know, what he'd like to see happening and, and not happening here. And um, I, I thought they had a great uh, presentation. I thought that he's uh, a very soft spoken type uh, of, uh, you know, a gentleman, if you will. And, uh, you know, all his uh, his answers were thought of uh, before he spoke, and I thought he said a lot of the right things. But uh, the reality is, he knows as well as uh, everybody else, he's got his hands full. But I think it's a step in the right direction. And Jeff Gordon, who ultimately, uh, like Stu said, is a guy that's going to be working closely and directly uh, with him, uh, ultimately had the uh, the final word. Say, listen, I think we can make this work uh, as as a duo. And I'm hoping that uh, that will be the case and we can start to look at some more positive things, obviously, moving forward. Yeah, I, I was pretty encouraged by what I've heard behind the scenes. Uh, I talked to a few people that know Kent Hughes and the consistent thing that I hear back 
is that he is among every agent that they know the most focused on player development, which guess what is probably the weakest part of the Montreal Canadians under the Bergevin era. They just have not graduated players have not graduated. Good players. The best player that uh, has developed under the Canadians that they're still have on the roster is probably Arturi Lekkonen, who I am a big fan of Arturi Lekkonen's game, but he's not an impact player at, in your top two lines, right? Like he's not a, a star player and you need to be able to develop some star players in order to win in this league. You can't just always go to the UFA market or the trade market, which was uh, Mark Bergevin's favorite thing. So that's really encouraging. The one quibble that I have with this hire, and it's just in the back of my brain is that anytime you look at other NHL organizations and guys come in and the first thing that they do is hire their buddy, it's not always a bad thing, but it's like a bit of not a red flag, but a yellow flag. Like if they're going to hire buddies, we'll see what the rest of the management group looks like to see if there's more, some more diversity of thought. But if they're just going to keep on hiring buddies, it's very similar to the start of Mark Bergevin's uh, t- tenure with the Montreal Canadiens, where it was just like guys that he played with. It's a little bit different because we've got guys from different backgrounds. So it's already a, a better spot, but there's, Something in my brain that is always like, if you're going to hire your friend, you know, it, uh, did you hire the best candidate or the one that you personally like the most? But everything so far points to Kent Hughes being a great candidate. Well, I they're not best friends. No, no, I, no. Think, <laughs> I know. And he, he, that was hilarious. It was the best line also, of the whole presser. But. Also, I, I and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, I think Jeff Molson made the point that he made first contact with Kent Hughes, which I – think they tried their very best to kind of eliminate the idea that the Canadians were well at least Jeff Gordon's case was going to hire his friend we know there is the connections between the two in terms of uh Jeff Gordon wanting to hire Kent Hughes for the Rangers back in 2018 uh their their kids their families I'm, I'm sure they, they know each other in some respects I'm sure but I think Jeff Molson saying that he's the one who spoke to to, to Kent Hughes first before Jeff Gordon that might have also played a part in them trying to not, you know, have nepotism be in part of this. Uh, Stu, you go ahead. I don't, I don't think Molson spoke to him first, though, Julian. I think Molson said it was the oh, first I got time. That wrong. He, it was the first time he'd ever spoken to Kent Hughes. He had never spoken oh, to him okay. before. I misunderstood. Until, quote, until they had, until he had his meeting with him, which was near the end of uh, of the process. He, which it, Molson said, I you know, know friends of his who played hockey in the West Island with Kent Hughes and and that. But the the thing with Kent Hughes is that. Some people might not know, but he was a heck of a player as a kid also. He was captain of the Lac St. Louis Midget AAA Lions. Uh, he played at Collège Saint-Laurent. He went to Middlebury College. I spoke with his coach at Middlebury College. He said in the 35 years that he's coached hockey, Kent Hughes had the best hockey sense of any player he ever coached. Uh, his skating wasn't great. He was a small guy, which is why he never ended up playing in the NHL. As he said yesterday, this is the second best thing, uh, being a GM. But as Hughes said, he's lived in the player's world for the last 20 years. He knows how mm-hmm. players think. He can relate to young players. He talked about how, you know, players are on the third line are upset because they want to be on the second line because they can make more money as a second line player. He understands how players work. And I think there was a disconnect there with Mark Bergevin. He was from the old school of players. I don't think he could relate well to the younger players, which I think led to some of the confrontations he had in, in, in salary negotiations and whatnot. And Kent Hughes is negotiated contracts. He knows, he knows what players are worth. And I spoke with Tori Mitchell a former Canadian who played 10 years in the NHL and Hughes was his agent all along. And he said, the thing he liked most about Kent Hughes is he was honest. He didn't always maybe like what he told you, but he told you like what you were worth when you went into contract negotiations. And he said, as a player, that's all you want. You just want your agent and your GM to be fair with you and be honest with you. And I think those are going to be two of the real strong points for Kent Hughes moving forward. Uh, Rick, do you want any last thoughts here? Yeah, no, and, and even to say that, you know, uh, he's not really friends. So what if he if he was? Uh, these guys are under, you know, big time pressure to make things happen. So uh, the the hiring and the the, the working duel uh, is so critical in, you know, in making smart decisions. And uh, I think that, you know, they're going to complement each other in their – in their style and ways of doing things, because if that's not the case, obviously the they're going to have to face some music on that. So, uh, you know, I think that after the the, the process, as they talked about, uh, ultimately came down to hey, listen, friends, no friends, whatever. We want to have the best guy to step into this position that we feel is going to be able to do the job and 
And uh, Mr. Ken Hughes is the one that uh, ticked all those boxes, as they say. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing what his uh, approach will be. And there's no doubt. I mean, Jeff Gordon's a top dog here in hockey operations. There's no doubt about that. And and he, it's important that he had somebody that will work with him and work along with him. So that's why that relationship that they already have, I think, is really important. And as Gordon said at his first news conference, we wanted somebody who brought different skill set than he does, which Hughes does. And he also said at that original news conference, like, as time goes on, Kent Hughes will take on more and more responsibility and be more of the top dog in hockey operations moving forward. But there's a lot of work to be done. So Jeff Gorton is still the top dog with Kent Hughes working with him. And as time goes on, uh, Kent Hughes will become more and more of, uh, I don't want to say the top dog, but they'll be at least on an even level or, or Hughes will be more of the, 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 the GM role uh, and, and more the guy calling the shots. Exactly. Well, also on the flip side of the being friends things, sometimes when you're friends, it's a lot easier and you're more comfortable saying, Hey, that idea that you had, it's awful. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah, there can true. be a, a, like a, a smoothing over of something that could have created fric friction in a new relationship, right? So you're more comfortable disagreeing with each other and pushing each other a little bit harder. So there's that flip side to it too, being friends. And I think, I don't know who asked it, but uh, the one who was asking, uh, why did you interview 11 candidates if you were going to hire Hughes from the beginning? Have you ever hired anyone? I mean, part of that process is figuring out different ideas. Like maybe you don't hire Matthew Darsh or Daniel Briere or Emily Castonguay, but you hire and you hire Kent Hughes, but you really like some of the ideas that they brought. Jeff Gorton's still in hockey operations. He can say, hey, have you thought about this? Because this candidate brought up this. Let's bring that into the fold, into your ideas as well. That's just doing due diligence. Mm -hmm. I yeah. doubt that the process was Kent Hughes from the beginning and everything else was just done as a show a formality yeah that's just not how this kind of process works not a, not in a high level organization no and gordon also mentioned there's a possibility some of the people they interviewed for the gm job could be brought in in other positions yes 100 yep that, i think that's the next thing we need to look out for now like i've seen people wonder like oh does that mean matthew darsh could come in as an agm that name specifically i'd be surprised if he considered a role like that yeah he like can't Daniel go lateral right he doesn't right they probably wouldn't give him permission to do that a guy like Daniel Briere, however, might like the idea of moving up from an ECHL franchise to being AGM of the Montreal Canadiens, and it seemed as if he made an impression on Jeff Gordon and the rest of the Canadiens brass. Or um, maybe, maybe maybe Daniel Briere becomes GM of the Laval Rocket and nope. delegate, delegate yeah. that to somebody else because Gordon and, and uh, Hughes are going to have their hands full with the Canadiens. So maybe you just if they really impressed Daniel Briere, Laval Rocket are yours. That's a that's not bad. I mean, that could that could be attached to AGM duties, but that's a mm -hmm. decent step yeah. up. You go from well, ECHL yeah, to AGM. Exactly. Exactly. But also if Daniel Sauvageau has there's a position for her, Emily Castone Gay as well. I'm more I'm almost as intrigued as anything else to see is just to see what the rest of this front office will look like. But we also have to remember with Kent Hughes, and this is for anyone who's wondering about whatever plans he's laid out. Now, I guess this will segue into my next question eventually, but Remember, this is a guy who uh, signed, basically, like the Canadians realized that he was going to be the guy on Sunday. I think on Monday, they negotiated his contract. And then on Tuesday, they announced that he's GM. And then he's unveiled in front of everyone on Wednesday. So I kind of like the fact that he was like, hey, look, I, I still have to meet these guys. And by the time you watch this episode, he may very well be in the process of doing that. That being said, uh, he made it clear uh, that he wants the team to be fast. He wants them to be uh, on the puck. And yes, he does think about being defensively responsible, like another GM once said, but he just emphasized the offensive stuff a little bit more. Uh, Rick, what did you think of, of Kent Hughes uh, wanting to be fast and on the puck? Well, I mean, let's face it. He said what every GM in the league would like to uh, have at their disposal. But that he, is very fair. And he did you know, say in a perfect world, that's what he would want. You know, the, the reality is uh, stepping into this organization and trying to get a, a read on his, his personnel, you know, that's, uh, that's going to be the big challenge. He's going to have to identify, first of all, what kind of players uh, want to be part of this process that he's going to be involved in. And then he's got to identify and, you know, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, you talk about the culture, you, you, you talk about the desire and the willingness to be part of the Montreal Canadiens. 
all these things are going to come into play when it comes to decisions on on his personnel. But you know, the uh, the, the bottom line in all of this is uh, he wants to put his stamp on the type of people that uh, he'd like to see part of the Montreal Canadiens. Obviously, as early as it is now uh, for him to to understand what he has, but he's got a he's got his uh, hands cut out as far as you know. Uh, identifying his his players and and trying to figure out who uh, who fits the mix, who does not fit the mix, and I'm quite sure that there's going to be some interesting changes uh, as we uh, as we move forward in the schedule. Yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see how things play out because, like Rick said, most GMs kind of say the same thing when you ask them what kind of team they want to build, but at the same time, I just the way that he describes it sounds like the identity of the Montreal Canadiens to me, if you know what I mean. It seems like yeah. we've been in this period of time where Mark Bergevin wanted the Montreal Canadiens to play like Mark Bergevin as a player, and he acquired a bunch of players who were bigger versions of Mark Bergevin as a player. And the way that they played, I know it had a lot of success last year on their run to a Stanley Cup final, which, let's face it, was a lot on the back of Carey Price, which has been the case for most of the Canadiens' set success throughout his career. I would like to see the Canadians play the way that the Montreal Canadiens typically played. Obviously, you aren't going to get a 1970s Montreal Canadiens team that wins four cups in a row. It's not possible in today's salary cap league. But no. prioritizing playing fast, the offensive style. When's the last time the Montreal Canadiens had a legitimate offensive star, especially one that was homegrown? Like you saw last year, that or no, I guess it was two years ago now, Canadians fans absolutely lost it over 90 year old Ilya Kovalchuk. Like, that imagine was a fun having time, though, man. I think he was, he was only Kovalchuk 89. when he was a Canadian. Yeah, I think he was only 89, Andrew. He wasn't. Yeah, I know. Like, at that time. Like, like, <laughs> the Leafs. That's still one of the like. That's the one of the loudest times I've heard the Bell Center building go. And that, and to your point, like they've been starved for that. They have like prioritizing offense has just been something that this organization has been unwilling to do for a very long time. And like the last legitimately amazing both goal scoring and playmaking season we've seen has been like Alexi Kovalev back in 08, right? No disrespect to Max Pacioretty, who was a fantastic offensive player and one of the best goal scorers in the league for a very long time, even up to today. But he wasn't the guy who would take you on his back and carry you through. We've had that on defense. Andre Markov had been that. P.K. Subban had been that in the prime of his career. But at offense, they just haven't had that guy. So just the way that Hughes is speaking about prioritizing offense to me is very exciting because that translates to where the game is going now, unless you can find a Kale McCarr and then you can have the defense carry you, yeah. but that's pretty rare. As, as I've mentioned, I think several times in the show, you know, the last Canadians player to finish in the top 10 in NHL scoring was Matt Snazlin in 1986. Um, the last player the Canadians had who actually brought fans out of their seat that wasn't a goalie, it was P.K. Subban, and we know how that turned out. I know you mentioned, Andrew, last season, Carey Price has, for so many years, covered up a lot of this team's problems. I think back to game six against the Leafs, they were outshot 13-2 to two in overtime, and they won. If Carey Price lets in one of those goals, the whole thing is different. Mark Bergerman probably gets fired during the offseason, and, and it's a whole different world we would have been living in, right? Carey Price covered it all up last season with the way he played. But you're right, you know, what what – Hugh said is what every GM, you know, you want to play fast, you want to play, but you have to have those players to do that. But that's going to come. We're going to see that scouting moving forward on the players they pick. The days of drafting the Mike McCarrens of the world are over. You know, there's going to be guys who can skate and play a quick game. And, and that's the way the NHL is moving now. And as I mentioned earlier, Kent Hughes is a modern day thinker and he's been around players for a, for a long time. And then when trading, you know, Teams are more or less, you know, you build it through the draft and through trades and free agency. Um, for the trade thing, his clients, or his clients, good clients on different teams. And when he talks to them, he mentioned that, like, they don't just talk about them. Like, he might say, oh, this line mate of mine's lazy, or this guy's this. And he has all that information when it comes to acquiring guys. Red flags that he might know about players that other GMs don't because they don't have the access to the players that he's had over so many years. So it's refreshing uh, that he wants to play that style of game because not only have the Canes been bad for a long time, they've been brutally boring too. And uh, so he looks like he wants to play a more exciting style of play. And it won't be all about, you know, let's dump it in, let's check, and let's hope Carey Price saves our butt because we've seen that for the last 10 years. And it got them the one Stanley Cup final. Um, and, you know, Carey Price uh, 
his game was off a little bit in the final, let's say. He wasn't and, and they lost. So it's yeah. you can't I mean, they were they were tired. They were up against also a juggernaut of a team in the Tampa Bay Lightning. Price well. must have been ex- really tired. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Nobody yeah. was more tired than Carey Price. And we find out at you know he was playing with a bad knee and a bad hip in that too. But um and yeah. substance abuse issues. Substance right? use, substance use, not abuse. Well, that's sure. what's been out there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's um, I mean, yeah. but it, it's as I you know. It was a breath of fresh air that news conference. It really was. I think that's a. It was just a breath. It was a a new, um, smarter look at the game. More just just it's the old school is sort of gone, and the uh, um, it was just refreshing. It's- I just I just want to add this in terms of of players and and the style of play because Jeff Gordon also kind of made it clear that he was into that style as well in his introductory press conference. And I understand where the Canadians are in terms of the waiver wire. But them getting Rem Pitlick and Kale Clagg, two guys who are able to skate and are able to at least contribute in some way offensively, already that's a, even though they're like, you know, bottom level guys, that's already a distinct change from what the previous regime might have been into, I think. So I think in Dwight King, this, anyone? <laughs> Dwight King, Steve Ott, Andreas Martinson, I would argue, even in a small sample size, the Canadians have already started to try to prioritize having those types of players in that organization. I understand. I also understand there's COVID going around and they need bodies, but like I, I think the fact that they were able to get those two guys and say, Hey, we need young guys who are able to skate, move the puck around and be at least somewhat dynamic. They were able to get on that. And I'm not sure how, how much Mark Bergman would have done that in the past. Who knows? I, I agree with you, Julian. And, you know, the question that I have is the process is going to involve as far as how they make themselves better sooner than later. And, you know, do we look at, you know, lateral moves, pickups, uh, like they've done with the two that you've mentioned? Uh, Are they going to continue to try and identify some guys that they could maybe pick up uh, from other organizations that are going to fit somewhat of the mold that they like to see happening uh, uh, in the Canadians' uniform? Or are they going to, you know, really seriously consider uh, as we get down the stretch for the trading deadline to really shake up their roster and find ways to maybe move some big names uh, to get some other names back and have immediate impact, uh, you know, before the uh, before the end of the year. So I'm quite sure there's going to be many, many conversations on how do we get the ball rolling and where do we start and uh, let's get going because everybody is... Uh, holding their breath on saying, oh, wow, uh, what a great move. Uh, this is going to make our team better. This is going to be more entertaining. Uh, th- this particular player meets the culture of the uh, of the uh, Montreal uh, organization. And, uh, you know, they, they, they'll have to go down the list and, and try and identify and hopefully, uh, you know, make some moves. This is the last question I'll ask for you guys with regards to Kent Hughes and, and Jeff Gordon. Uh, I'll start with you, Andrew, since you didn't get to lead off a question until this point. What do you think are the biggest challenges when it comes to uh, rebuilding this team into being a championship contender? Well, I think it's twofold. The first is moving out term because right. there's a lot of it. Uh, it. It was not handed a situation that's very uh, fluid, we'll say. Uh, Mark Bergevin locked in this team for the next three years or so. And Hughes is going to have to figure out how to move out a lot of big contracts or there might be a lot of buyouts. You know, if you can buy guys out and just Molson King can be convinced to pay for nothing, then that's what they'll probably have to do with a few of these contracts. But they're going to have to get creative. And the other thing is the teardown is probably going to have to happen pretty quickly. So you're going to have to make big decisions on things like. Tyler Toffoli after the last game said, I want to stay here. I want to be part of the solution. I want to help like build the team back up to is a great player and seemingly a great person, but Mm -hmm. he is also so valuable. That contract is absolutely incredible. You look at a lot of analytics driven, like what are guys values? I've seen his value as about a 7.5 to $8 million player on the free market right now. Can you afford to keep a guy like Tyler to when you could possibly get like two first round picks for him? I don't know. Right? Like you have to figure out, what are the actual offers and who is actually worth keeping around? Because if this is a five year rebuild, let's say just spitballing at the end of it, Tyler Toffoli is not going to be an impact player anymore. 
right? Like even younger guys like Arturi Lekin, and that's like getting into the the wrong side of 30, right? So right. you have to make those decisions and make them relatively quickly to be able to have the uh, flexibility to build the team that you want to build. And when you're forced to make decisions that big that quickly, I think there's a big opportunity for mistakes to happen and maybe get undervalue on returns and trades. So it's it's a tough situation that Hughes has brought himself into. The, you know, the, the other thing is, as you say, he's got a lot of contracts, long-term contracts he's got to deal with and, and figure out what he's going to do. And, you know, Brandon Gallagher, Jeff Petrie, uh, guys like that. But the, the, the main thing is the Carey Price situation. It's like the elephant in the room. You know, the news that he's now going back to step one in his rehab it was arthroscopic knee surgery. It's not a major surgery. Like six months later and you're going back to step one, really? Like, you know, that whole Carey Price situation and drama around him is, is you know, at, at some point, I think Carey Price and Captain Shea Weber need to speak to, to us in the media and let fans know, like, like what's going on. Like, it's just, it's just it doesn't make sense to me that, you, you know, a week off, the, the practice really was close for a week, and that means the guy's got to go right back to stage one and from arthroscopic knee surgery. It's not – I've never had it, but I know a lot of people who have, and it's not a, a, a major, major surgery. The recovery period should I mean after he had the surgery, they said he was going to be ready to start the season. And then, you know, this, the substance use issue, that came into play, and he left for a month, so that puts you behind a little bit. But it's just such a bizarre situation. And with that contract, $10.5 million for four more years, he has a no-movement clause. I mean, that's, you know, the first person I think that, uh, you know, the new GM, Ken Hughes, needs to do is sit down with Carey Price and figure, like, well, what's going on here? Like, what's, you know, that that's that's the first thing I think he's got to take care of, and that's a big challenge. And with Shea Weber, like, is he going to play again? Is he retired? Will he ever play again? Who knows? We haven't heard from either of those guys since the Stanley Cup final ended. Yeah, I, I think they, they have their hands full as far as identifying. I mean, uh, Andrew mentioned about Toffoli wanting to, you know, be part of the organization moving forward. But, you know, is he really fit into that type of mold of a, a, a speedy guy that's going to uh, uh, be part of the makeup uh, of the their new team? And uh, I, I don't think so. So, and like you said, the price is right uh, for him to be moved. But I think that they really have to do some serious thinking about, okay, look at these names that we have with the term. Do these guys want to be part of this rebuilding and this process? Pain, it's going to be a pain process uh, moving forward to, to get competitive. And if guys don't want to be in, involved in this process, then they, they, those guys upstairs have to know about it and they have to do their best to accommodate them to, to maybe move them or you know, just do something to uh, to to get rid of that uh, that feel, if you will, uh, in the dressing room that some guys don't want to be part of this. So we're going to have to do something about it. So they uh, they have to identify those guys. They have to move on it. And uh, you know, they there's no quick fix. And I think that it's going to be a real challenge for those uh, you know those management people to to make some hard decisions. And also they have to look at the they're all of their am amateur, their pro, uh, their, their development, all of the people through the organization that made up make up the you know the, the big decisions of recommendations for selection of personnel have to be identified as they want them on board, they don't want them on board because ultimately, when you have new management come in, they want to bring in their own, their own people, and uh, they have some work to do on that front too, as far as deciding. This guy is somebody we want to keep around. This guy uh, is not. And, you know, and then look to fill those uh, voids. Yeah, the other challenge, the immediate challenge, I think, is the coach. What's Dominic Ducharme? You know, it's it's there's more than half the season still left. And this is a team that has not, you know, Jeff Petrie has spoken out publicly, the frustration with the system they're playing. Jeff Petrie is playing like a guy who wants to get traded. Um so do you go, but it's more than half, you know, so many nights it's just this team hasn't competed. The compete level was higher when they had the Laval Rocket guys on the ice. Um, so do you want to go at another half a season if that's the case, if the guys aren't playing for the coach anymore? Uh, you know, you, they're tanking. I mean, that became obvious when the Canadians agreed to play a game with uh, 18 players when half, half the team was out with COVID, uh, New Year's Day in Florida. But 
you know, once that losing, Rick, you know this better than anybody, once that losing environment and, and that I don't give a crap sort of attitude gets into a locker room, I think it's hard to get rid of. And there's half, it's not like there's 20 games left. There's more than half the season left. So there's a lot of games. That, I think that's something that Kent Hughes is going to, you know, he was asked about it. He's not going to come out and say, I'm going to fire the coach, obviously, in his first day as GM. He's going to sit and talk with Dominic Ducharme. But I think he's got to, if, if he's, he's going to, you know, Hughes said he's going to get to know all the players and talk with them. And if he'll be asking them, what do you think about the coach? You know, what's, and if, if he figures that, that the environment in the room is going to be bad, if Dominic Ducharme remains as coach, then I think he's got to at least find an interim coach to get him to the next season. If he wants to bring in his own guy. Yeah, I want Andrew to hop in here. Yeah, I mean, I just want to see some uh, transparency from the coaching staff a little bit right now because this is not necessarily a challenge for Kent Hughes, but uh, I I just don't understand what the process is right now because you look at the last game, which they won. It's great. It was a fun game, really fun game, actually one of the most fun games to watch all season. But you look at the lines going into that game, and it's very clear that Ducharme is going for balance. Why? What, what are we trying to accomplish with balancing the lines? Is it to be competitive? Because that hasn't worked. All season long, they're still on pace for just 15 regulation wins out of 82 games, which is the lowest of any team that is an expansion team in the, since 1990, except for the Quebec Nordiques, who were tanking for, I believe, Eric Lindros. So, like, there ain't no Eric Lindros at the end of this. Shane Wright's good, but not Eric Lindros. So... Yeah. If they're not necessarily competitive, why are you not constructing lines that will likely be together in the future and telling them, go, have the freedom, don't worry about the mistakes that you make, make up for it on the next shift and figure it out. Develop that chemistry, play the way you want to play, fit into the system, because I just, I don't see the point right now of balancing lines. It doesn't make sense to me. And also, why are Sherratt and Savard together? Because <laughs> if you're trying to build up Sherratt's trade value, why are you putting him with a guy who has the exact same weaknesses and they're just, it's worse than oil and water. It's like oil and a propane torch. You know, oh my like, God. Every time and the Canadians <laughs> allow a goal, the camera immediately pans to Savard it's and Sherratt. And you're like, oh, yeah, what no. were they doing there? Just and stop. Kent Hughes has to find a way to offload Ben Sherratt as a result. That's yes. what I'm wondering, man. Like that, Put him back like, where he had success. A lot yeah. of things are going to work, Ben Sherratt. I think, I think you're yeah, being sure. quite, quite tough on him, Andrew. But I always wonder, watching David Savard play, if he gets his – uniforms at scotch garden before every game because he's lying on the ice so much he must be soaked by the end of the, the game and not from sweat and I'm, I'm not even trying to say that each guy is terrible like i think there are positives to both savard and Sherrod, but together they don't mask each other's weaknesses whatsoever like Sherrod had a lot of success early in the season playing with petrie petrie was struggling but a lot of the things that Petrie does that are just understated and don't produce points allowed Sherratt to cheat a little bit, to pinch in offensively, to be more physical. Savard doesn't provide that because they have the same issues. They have like the lateral mobility issues. They have getting too physical and ignoring the puck issues. And they both kind of get lost in coverage in the defensive zone, chasing guys. It just doesn't work together. And if you're trying to build a guy's value up, even if teams do value Sherratt a lot still, you know, if they continue going the rest of the year, getting like 25% of the goal, the goals when they're on the ice until the trade deadline, like the value is going to drop because people are going to say, well, yeah. Sherratt, we like him because he's physical and he's big. But if we get out scored four to one while he's on the ice, he's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But the yeah. thing I, I think GMs are looking, it's only six months ago, the Stanley cup final. It's not like it's three years ago. And I think GMs around the league remember the bench rod who played and how, and he's made for the playoffs and then maybe they're feeling sorry for him. Oh my God. <laughs> maybe, but he was also playing with Shea Weber, right? right now, but, but I think Sherrod's going to get a first round pick and, and possibly more on the trade market. He's, and he's a solid character guy. He's a guy that'd be good in the room. He's a lead, got a lot of leadership qualities. He's tough. Uh, he's willing to drop the gloves if he has to, not that that happens much anymore in the playoffs, but he's a, just a tough physical guy to play against. So I, I don't think, I understand what you're saying. I mean, he doesn't look good, but I think James, the, the, the memory of the Stanley cup final is fresh enough in their minds. The other concern though, with the coaching decisions is on a team where the compete level and the work ethic has been a big problem. How do you make Michael Pozzetta a healthy scratch? How does yeah, that happen? 
That's a How lot of questions. Happen? What message are you sending to the rest of the team when your hardest working guy out there, the guy that you notice every time he's on the ice and you make him a healthy scratch. And then the next game he comes back and he scores a goal off his face. Why? Because he's standing in front of the net and going to the dirty areas like so many on this guys on this team won't do. They don't oh, care how it goes in. It can go in off your butt, off your face. It's a goal. He's got three goals. He's got more goals than Cole Caulfield and Yoel Armia combined after that game. Think about that. Oh, and he's man. got healthy scratch. He does. Like, yeah, I, I don't think he's coming out of the lineup again. How at least does, he shouldn't. How does that, like, what, not only what message does that send to Michael Pizzetta, what message is that sent to the other guys in the room? Like, really? That's the guy you're going to sit out? Like, I, I, I'm still shaking my head about that one. Yeah, well, you, have to, you have to question the uh, the intelligence of that decision when you uh, you, you know you don't do, do something like that. If they're talking about balancing their, balancing their lines, well, uh, he's the type of ingredient that you're missing in in trying to balance your line. So. Yeah. You uh, yeah. Good head scratcher. And, you know, get, kind of getting back to the coaching uh, situation, uh, when uh, Ken Hughes was asked about the coach, he was very, very diplomatic in stating that, uh, you know, a lot of it has has come from cir- circumstantial uh, situations and left it at that. It didn't, didn't go any farther other than say, I will be meeting with him. I will be trying to get a feel for what he's all about, which is, you know, fair enough. But uh, for me, the bottom line is your team is not competing each and every night. That's something you can control with or without talent. So why is that not happening each and every night? So there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to be fired on the, to the coach's side and interesting how they, uh, how they handle it when it comes back to their answers. Yeah, he was Man, also that that was he wants a coach. He wants a coach to coach the style that the team's going to play. He mentioned, you know, John Cooper is the perfect coach for Tampa. He mentioned Barry Trotz, the perfect coach for the New York Islanders. If he wants to play a fast game, a fast puck control game, is Dom Ducharme the coach for that? Doesn't seem that's, like that's for That's for Kent Hughes to decide as, what, as well as other roster decisions. We could talk about Kent Hughes and this whole decision all day, but unfortunately we do not have the time to do that. But I hope everyone enjoyed uh, this amazing edition of Hockey Inside Out here. Uh, Kent Hughes, he definitely has his... Uh, Work cut out for him as GM of the Montreal Canadiens for the next few seasons. Uh, Let us know in the comments uh, what you think about Ken Hughes as GM of the Montreal Canadiens. You could also submit questions that you'd like any of us to answer in a bonus episode. We're able to do that. Subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter, montrealgazette.com slash newsletters, and subscribe to the YouTube page because that's where you get all the episodes for this show. And of course, visit hockeyinsideout.com for more. Thanks so much for watching and listening, guys. Peace.